thank you both very much for, for joining us. Um, this is the third mixtapes we're going to have done. Um, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to watch back the other two yet, but I think they I think they've got some decent content. Um, so it's hopefully just a fairly fairly lighthearted discussion, gives you a chance to talk about what interests you, what your um, what your respective areas are about, what um, um well yeah, and anything else you feel uh, you feel happy or interested to chat about. Um, so if you just start off, just give us a, a brief introduction to your your part of the world. So where you stay, what your region's about, and the, the different vineyards that you work with. Um, if you could start us off, Isol. Oh, okay. So hi, I'm Isol. I'm from KWV in South Africa. So KWV is situated in the most southern point of, of Africa. So it's the Western Cape. Um, and the South African wine industry has been around for more than 350 years. Um, so we are the one only country that have an official date when the first wine was made. And it's the 2nd of February, 1659. Um, and there is about um, 95,000 hectares planted of vines in South Africa. Um, and that's only 4.1% of the total production in the world. Um, it's 1.5 million tons of grapes. So it's, it's quite a lot. And I think, I think a lot of people think that South Africa is a new um, world wine producing country, but we've been around for quite a long, long time. The nice thing about the South African wine industry is that we have about uh, 290,000 people employed in the wine industry, not just in the wineries, but in uh, the vineyards, people picking the grapes, um, producers that deliver grapes from marketing to sales. There's quite a lot of people um, involved in the wine industry. Um, and there's 560 wineries currently in South Africa. And also there's about more than 3,000 wine growers in South Africa. So really we've, we've the wine industry in South Africa is a big part of the South African economy and we drive it with a lot of passion. And I think that's the, that's the thing that stands out for me in the South African wine industry currently is the new experimentation, innovation, um, and the exciting thing about South Africa is that we're pushing the boundaries. Um, but I think a lot of countries say, say that uh, with the younger generation of winemakers, because I'm hopefully one of the younger generation winemakers. Um, but yeah, so we buy grapes from all over the Western Cape. Um, it's the most southern point of Africa. And we are so diverse, not just in languages. We've got 11 official languages in South Africa, but we are also so diverse in soil types and grape varietals and just the winemaking styles that we produce. Fantastic. That's in a nutshell. That's great. Well, and, and what about you, Steve? Tell us a bit about your area of Australia. Yeah, well, um, we're we're in the. I'm I'm, I'm Steve Weber. I'm from Devortley Winery. Um, the the area that I sort of live in is the Yarra Valley, which is uh, uh, sort of one of the cooler regions in Australia. It's um, you know it's located about uh, fifty kilometres east of Melbourne, and uh, so it's very close to a sort of large metropolitan area. Really, sort of you know a, an amazing sort of city and. And uh, yeah, lovely sort of wine and food culture, as many of you would have experienced. Um, but I, I suppose you know to really describe the Yarra Valley, it's it's one of the most you know beautiful wine regions in the world. Um, and uh, you know, and I've always sort of said that you can't make uh, sort of beautiful wine in an ugly place. So um, uh, it certainly does help to wake up in the morning at uh, you know such sort of you know um, sort of length of views and uh, you know really sort of beautiful landscape. Um, we have, you know, as well, we, we've got, even within our region, the Yarra Valley, we've got a lot of, um, of sort of diverse climates, you know, our, our rainfalls can, can range depending on where you are in the valley from, from sort of, you know, um, 700 millimetres or 20, 25 uh, sort of inches of rain up to about 1.2 metres of rain in some parts of, of the Yarra Valley. And that sort of enables us to, to grow certain varieties in in different parts of the valley and do it very well, you know. So, um, you know, there aren't many regions, um, you know, that can boast some really fabulous Cabernet, for example, in one part of the valley, 
and, uh, you know, fantastic Chardonnay or, you know, cool climate Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in another part of the valley. Um, so it does have sort of um, some advantages in terms of the sites and, you know, things like that that we have and the diversity of style um, sort of, and, and I guess it's the, you know, it's that diversity of style that's pretty interesting about the Yarra. Um, I also work with um, some other regions in Victoria. Um, we've got um, some quite large, you know, vineyard holdings in central Victoria in a place called Heathcote and uh, where we're growing mainly sort of, you know, southern French varieties and a little bit of Iberian, uh, you know, sort of stuff as well. So it's mainly um, Sierra Grenache, as the red uh, sort of grape varieties in the south, but but uh, we also are experimenting with you know Tempranillo, Tarriga Nationale um, in red grape varieties, and some of the whites of things like Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris, and and you know sort of anything that would perform really well in in hot climates and you know that type of thing. So, and the other region I deal with is King Valley, which is um, you know northeast Victoria about two hours um, you know, northeast of the Yarra Valley Drive. Uh, and it's in that region that we specialise mainly in, um, in Italian varieties. So we, we, we grow Australian Prosecco, we uh, grow Fiano, Pinot Grigio, Sangiovese, etc. Excellent. I, mean, that, I think that probably leads us on to um, talking about like climate and climate change. I know there's been a big move in Australia to plant more Mediterranean varietals. Um, things that will naturally cope with hotter climates. Um, can you just talk a bit about how how that's affecting your business, um, plans you're making moving forwards? Whether you're looking at different varietals, different areas, just anything on anything on that subject? Yeah, sure. We um, in the Yarra Valley, um, we've you know we we're certainly seeing um, a diverse range of sort of vintages and things like that. You know, and it's mm -hmm. certainly um, we've noticed over the last sort of twenty five years that things have got earlier. Uh, there's no question about that. But, um, you know, I think we've we've learned to adapt a little bit. Um, we we had a, we had phylloxera come into our region, you know, probably 15 years ago. Um, and we've, and, you know, that's for, for those that don't know, it's sort of, it's a vine louse that sort of destroys the, you know, the vineyards. Um, and it hasn't sort of destroyed all of the vineyards, but, you know, in sections, it's, it's um, you know, certainly forced us to replant some of our vineyards. But having that opportunity to replant has been quite interesting in that we've, we've been able to review what, what varieties grow, grow well in different places. And where we perhaps planted Pinot Noir 25 years ago, where now if those particular sites are quite warm, um, now and and are producing you know a, you know, less sort of special wine I suppose you know um, you know maybe wines which are a bit more savoury and it's, you know it's getting a little bit hot for Pinot Noir we're looking at planting varieties like sort of Gamay Noir for example or Syrah or you know those types of things and in whites um, you know there's a lot of people looking at at um, at sort of uh, or, you know, alternate varieties to, um, you know, to that and Albrino, you know, being one thing that we're looking at at the moment. But, um, you know, I suppose we we um, have learnt to adapt a little bit, but um, but we've we've certainly been changing some of the row orientation, changing some of the aspects, changing the varieties on where they grow on the property, etc. Um, but I I don't generally think that um, we're we're suffering badly from climate change in terms of, um, you know, the styles we make. I think we've, we've learned to adapt a little bit um, to the, to the changing climate, um, you know, you know, perhaps with Chardonnay, it's things like picking earlier uh, mm -hmm. with Pinot Noir. It's uh, some of the new clonal material that we have that enjoy um, the, the, or, you know, ripen later and, uh, you know, give us a, a better picking spectrum um, of flavors and that type of thing so we're 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 slowly adapting and uh, but i i don't think we're we're making any less um sort of quality wine now than we were 20 years ago with uh, a lot of the same vineyards okay excellent and how about you as well how's 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 it going in the cape with regards to that yeah i think i think in on our side in south africa um we thought that climate change is going to have a drastic change in quality and where you grow varietals but 
because South Africa is quite so diverse, also with different regions and there's so many, all the different varietals is planted in all of the regions almost, just on specific sites. They maybe focus more on a Shiraz or a Cabernet, but um, overall in South Africa, I can agree that we're not, we're not concerned about the quality. Uh, we thought that we're going to have a lot earlier harvest this year, and then we are two week, weeks later than usual. Um, and, and the grapes are actually ripening on time, and it gets to optimum ripeness. Um, I can just see how it, it's changed back to 10 years ago when I started making wine. So 10 years ago, we actually had a really long uh, uh, vintage, and now we're back to that. The past three, four years with the drought, we had very compact, small, um, intense vintages, like four or five weeks. Um, but now it's almost going back to normal, even though we get a lot of heat waves during, during harvest. Um, and this year, especially, a lot of rain during harvest. But, um, yeah, it's not impacting the quality. I must say, actually, it's, it's actually better for the vines because a longer ripening period, um, and a bit of rain sometimes just give us a breather in the winery. So when we're at full capacity, like we've been for the last three weeks, we can just take a breather. Like today, it's actually raining in South Africa. So the harvest came to standstill. Um, but quality-wise, um, I'm not concerned. Uh, but let's see what the future holds. And I think another in another 10 years, we're going to have this discussion again, and then we might change our minds. But like Steve also said, we are adapting to what we're doing and we are adapting to the winemaking styles. And I think there's a lot more attention to detail and a lot more information currently available for us to change the styles. Um, there's so many different styles in the world. And um, because KWV buy from 54 different producers from all over the Western Cape, we get Shiraz from six, seven different regions. Um, and looking at your picking dates, understanding the vineyards. And I've been at the company for 10 years and I, I still don't understand the vineyards, maybe 10%. So there's still a lot more to learn. And I think we adapt. And I think the new generation of winemakers are more adaptable. They change to what's going on because we are forced in the, the current situation in the world. Uh, for the last two years, you need to adapt or you, you're going to die. Um, so that's that's what we try to do. And we adjust everything, not just in winemaking styles, but in your lifestyle as well, because there's so many changes currently happening in the world. So, I mean, you both work with a really wide range of varietals. Um, are there any particular ones that you, well, like what, what, are, your, what are your favorites to work with? What's it, what excites you at the moment? Um, Azelle, what are you part um, of this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm very, I, I love niche varietals. Um, I, I love playing around with, that's why I have a Petit Verdot in the bottle, Cabernet Franc, I've got a Carmenere. Um, there's other varietals that I play with. With I play around with Mouvedre, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Malbec, Petit Chira, Tempranillo. There's so many different varietals that we get into the winery and we play around. And uh, for me, that's the exciting part of, not just South Africa, but the world is, yes, we all produce Cabernets and Shirazes and Sauvignon Blancs and Chardonnays, but I think there's a hidden secret in all these different niche varietals like Petit Verdot. Um, France, Bordeaux, they do produce a bit of Petit Verdot, but it all goes into the Bordeaux blends. Um, in South Africa, Petit Verdot is the hidden gem where we actually can produce a wine that can stand up as a single varietal and we have the climate to get it to optimum ripeness. So Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc for me is one of those varietals that I just, I've got this love-hate relationship with them. When they arrive in the winery, I'm like, oh no, it's Petit Verdot again, because it's got all these small little green berries in between the bigger berries. And with the hand sorting, it, it's not fun to work with Petit Verdot. But then when you crush the grapes and you taste the juice of the wonder of cold soaking, it's pitch black and it's got all this fruit concentration and it just makes amazing wines and adding five or ten percent of Petit Verdot to a blend just makes the blend 10 to 15 times better so it's always my hidden secret to all the blends 
where I just add a 5% of petri vado, and it just brings aromas of plums and dog fruits, but also a bit of lift on the nose with florals, violets. It's almost like a perfume shop when you walk into it. Um, so there's, there's a lot. I, could, I love talking about niche varietals because it's exciting new varietals that we can actually, and some of them, they are niche for us as South Africans, like the Italian varietals, Sangiovese and Nebbiolo. We, we're not used to having these varietals in South Africa, but lots more uh, wine producers are starting to plant them and playing around with them and experimenting with them. And you can see small pockets that are bottled on their own um, in South Africa currently. Excellent. And what, what about you, Steve? Obviously, the, the history of Italian varietals in Yara is a bit a bit bigger than it is in, it is in um, South Africa, but you've got a big big range to work with too. Yeah, look, we, we do. Um, my sort of feeling um, at the moment is that, uh, you know, it, might, it, it may not be my absolutely favourite variety, but I think one of the most interesting varieties we're, we're, um, we're doing quite a lot of work with at the moment is Grenache. Um, out of uh, some of the warmer districts, and um, you know, I think historically Australia has um, has always sort of uh, you know grown you know Shiraz in in every region, and it's probably only recently that people are now starting to look at um, is Shiraz the best you know sort of red grape variety for some of our warmer climates, and how can we you know how can we utilize uh, you know things like Grenache that love the heat even more. Um, to produce um, some charm and things like that in some of those sort of, you know, in some of those blends with Shiraz. And I think um, I was at a tasting this morning with a, a group of retailers and uh, we were talking about the role of Grenache in Australia um, being incredibly important um, for those warm, warm districts. And I sort of said to, to one of them that I wouldn't perhaps make Shiraz again sort of... Um, Sort of without adding, you know, forty percent Grenache, for example, to it. Um, you know, I just think Grenache is such an important, you know, variety. And um, and Adele was speaking about, um, um, you know, Carignan and some of those varieties. I think they have a an important role as well. But um, and some of the some of the retailers said to me only forty percent. You know, I would have thought you'd need a lot more in Australian Shiraz to make it. Um, more approachable and more drinkable and softer and more more perfumed and more elegant. So I think, um, you know, Grenache is going to play an incredibly important part and some of the other Southern Rhone varieties, I think, in some of our warmer districts. Um, so I guess that really excites me. Um, it's it's pretty easy in, in, in the cooler climates and, you know, particularly some of the cooler aspects in the cooler climates to be excited by Chardonnay. Pinot Noir, we, we all are, of course, but um, but it, it is interesting that um, a lot of our work at the moment is on trying to make Cabernet um, taste taste really interesting for some of the younger generation. Um, in Australia, um, a lot of the younger people don't drink Cabernet anymore. That's sort of the domain of, of old folk like me. And, uh, you know, so all my kid, my kids, and you know the young winemakers here all drink, you know Pinot Noir. They all drink Gamay. They drink Grenache. They drink all of those types of things, and very few of them drink Cabernet. And uh, you know, one of the wines that we we we're putting on tonight is a is is a Cabernet made in Amphora that um, has got a different shape to to the wine. And I think um, we've we've got to. Um, we've got to look at ways of making Cabernet appealing to to some of the younger drinkers and maybe the next generation of of wine enthusiasts, and um, you know that it isn't a um, you know it isn't sort of the you know domain of old people and um, you know Bordeaux type you know cravats and all the rest of it. It's uh, it's more you know that it, it 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 is a beautiful wine and it has got a softness and a richness and. Um, but it's also got sort of, you know, really nice complexity. So we're doing a lot of, um, of experimentation this year to try and make Cabernet perhaps not taste so much like Cabernet, but just really interesting dry red wine. So, um, you know, that's sort of where, where I think some of the really interesting sort of challenges are and, you know, exciting opportunities. Excellent. Uh, Craig, uh, sorry that I, I want to jump in here. 
Um, yeah. Then I'm not the younger generation of winemakers because I love Cabernet and Shiraz and uh, that really big, bold, um, bold wines. Um, I'm, I'm not the biggest um, Gamay fan, um, but we also produce a lot of Grenache Noir and it does add, add something to, to the Shirazes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, historically, like when, when I first became aware of Australian wine coming to the UK in the in the nineties, there were all it was always blends. It was Shiraz and Cabernet, and it was Shiraz and Grenache, and it's there's been a real move towards single varietal, and I think people have kind of learned that. So do you have to, I guess, you sort of have to make people unlearn what they what they associate with particular wine styles as they as as they change and evolve. Um, so, I mean, in the UK, what's the how how big a part of your business does the UK represent? Is it is it different to your domestic market? Um, what do you sell in the UK compared to at home? Uh, so, uh, in, if you look just at Cadbury, we produce about sixteen million liters of wine every year. Um, in our whole portfolio, the UK is quite important for us. Um, but if you look at the small little brand I'm involved in, uh, that's our biggest market mm-hmm. for mentors so the uk is selling the most mentors in the world and um exports for for the mentors brand is about 95 percent is international and which uh, the uk is the biggest and then in the local market um it's always that price bracket where where you get really good quality entry-level wines that the people would rather buy than looking at they'll buy a niche bottle or a bit more expensive bottle maybe once a month um, but for us, the UK market is very, very important. And it is quite different because the, the wines that sell quite a lot in the UK isn't always the wines that sell the most in, in South Africa. But um, like I said, the people will, there's so many good quality everyday drinking wines in South Africa. And remember, we're competing with the world when we export to, to the UK. In South Africa, the biggest difference between international countries and and South Africa, we don't have access to a lot of international wine. So 99% of the wine that South Africans drink is South African wine. We don't have the opportunity to buy a lot of Australian wine, French wine, or Italian wine. We need to import it, or you get specialized wine shops. In Cape Town, we've got a few... Uh, there's a few people that import some of these really good quality wines, but South Africans drink South African wine. Um, for us as winemakers, we get wines, international wines, and we get the opportunity to taste it and to drink it and to buy it. Um, but in South Africa, it's more local sales. Uh, we're in, in the UK, we're competing against the rest of the world. But in South Africa, we don't we only compete against our own South African wines. Yeah, and and you know, for us, uh, you know, the UK is a really important, uh, you know, it's an important market, um, mainly at the sort of lower end. But what what's really encouraging uh, for for us is that we're seeing some fantastic sales at the moment of some of our single vineyard wines and premium wines. And uh, you know, we've we've got, you know, I think North South with a lot of the work they're doing is um, you know really encouraging, and uh, you know, I think it's pretty exciting. Um, we always get told that we're too expensive in Australia, of course. Um, but that's just sort of one of the things, you know, we've got to be, you know, the, the UK market's a pretty savage um, sort of market for price. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think, um, you know, more and more people are, people are really interested in what Australia's doing. And I think, you know, some of the, some of the sort of more elegant um, sort of styles, particularly for, for a lot of the sommeliers and uh, fine wine retailers and things like that, I think, um, you know, I think there's an enormous opportunity. Excellent. Uh, and in terms of your own winemaking, um, where have you, well, how long have you been winemaking for? Um, how did you get into it? And where have you made wine around the world, Steve? Um, okay, well, I, I sort of got into it when I was, um, uh, you know, 18 or 19. My father was an agronomist, so he was sort of a, a technical guy in the vineyards and, you know, that type of thing. And I took some interest from in what he was doing, he was consulting to a few a few of the larger you know wine companies, um, and uh, I started at, you know working for a very small winery in the Barossa called uh, called Leo Buring just as a, as a seller hand, 
and uh, I was lucky enough to be put through university by by that particular company. And um, I worked with them for around sort of 10 years in several different locations, you know, in, in Australia, Coonawarra, um, uh, in the in the sort of river districts of Sunraysia um, and, uh, uh, and in the Barossa. But um, uh, when I married Leanne de Bortley, my life sort of changed and we moved uh, to the Yarra Valley and we've been here for 30, 33 years this year. And uh, we, um, we, we love every aspect of, of this sort of region and, uh, and you know, that type of thing. Um, we've done various, uh, you know, stints of working overseas. We, we leased a small vineyard in Burgundy for three years and uh, we, we did a little bit of experimentation. Didn't learn anything about winemaking but, um, or growing grapes. Just, just really a philosophy on, on understanding the soil that you cultivate and uh, understanding vineyards was, you know, is, is one of the things I think that the French are so good at. Um, in terms of their their sort of philosophy, um, you know, I think you you um, you know learning about you know understanding you know several things like um, you know trying to find detail in wine and things like that from from the vineyards, trying to sort of um, select out parcels of fruit or you know sections of 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 you know sections of the vineyard that are are pulling back the quality of the of the final product and um, maybe dividing the you know vineyard up into smaller batches so that we can identify some of the better some of the better parcels. So I think um, you know the French have had you know thousands of years to um, to section off you know various parts of Burgundy and here we are we've got you know we might have um, you know a twenty hectare block of of uh, you know Pinot Noir or a twenty hectare block of Chardonnay, and really there's probably there's probably five blocks in a lot of that five very very different blocks of Chardonnay, sort of you know, um, yeah, I guess within that twenty hectares. So you know we're we're gradually you know sort of starting to learn more and more about our vineyards and where our best fruit comes from, etc. You know through through some of those experiences. And um, how about you, Adele? Yeah, so I was actually a, a tennis player in America. I didn't think about anything about winemaking. Uh, so I went to America after um, school and then um, I got an injury, a knee injury, and I decided to come back to South Africa. Um, but my father was a viticulturist. So I grew up with wine and I grew up with the vineyards and we had every Sunday we had a small glass of wine to taste. So I started tasting when I was like five years old, but it is, it really it excited me when I got the injury, I came back to South Africa and I didn't know what to study. And the first thing that came to mind was, why don't you become a viticulturist or a winemaker? Um, because I have a passion for nature and I like to be outdoors. And also I love chemistry and I'm very innovative, like the artist, part of life and uh, pushing the boundaries. So then I went to the University of Stellenbosch. There's two places in South Africa where you can actually study to become a winemaker. Uh, I went to the university and then I had to do an internship for three months in harvest time. So I did it in, um, in Paul where I grew up and it's where KWV is situated. So it was easy. It's a kilometer from my house where I grew up. So I did my vintage at KWV. And then after my fourth year of university, KWV phoned me and said, we've got a position open. Do you want to come and join the KWV team? So I joined the KWV team. I've been at KWV now for 12 years. Um, first, I did all the white wines and premium red wines, and now I'm only focusing on all the premium brands at KWV. And also I've got a few different departments uh, where we look after our pre-bottling seller, all the wines that goes into the bottle and also doing all the wine competitions. So it's a bit of a diverse role at the moment. So the winemaking portion is a bit smaller than it used to be, but it's still the thing that excites me. Um, and I've done a, a, a harvest in Italy, in Umbria, um, and I've done a lot of marketing travel um, with Coopers and tastings and going to the UK every now and then and visiting Canada and Africa and Portugal. 
So my love for winemaking actually started at home um, and growing up in the wonderful region in the Western Cape and um, being surrounded by vineyards every single day. When you walk out of your house, you can see vineyards. Um, so I think it just came naturally. Um, and with my father being a viticulturist, um, yeah, it, that's where I started loving wine and I still like it. And um, like I always say, we, there's so much more for us to learn and um, understanding the vineyards, like Steve mentioned, I don't think I've got an understanding of it. I've only understand it like 10%. Um, but that's for me the most important, important thing of winemaking is understanding your vineyards going it out into the vineyards and tasting the berries and making decisions. What I do is I make decisions on every single row where we do pickings um, and treating it totally different in the winery. So that's more the innovation and the experimentation side. Great. And if you could pick um, one region to go and make a vintage in, where would you, where would you like to go, Azel? Sure. If I would pick one region to go and do a vintage in, it would probably be uh, Duro, in the Duro Valley um, in Portugal, just because everyone thinks that they only produce port, but they make exceptionally good red wines. I think there's also a gem that you can actually go and get in, in Portugal. Um, that would be one region. If I want to change lifestyle, I would go to Italy. Um, I've been there a few times. For me, the lifestyle in Italy is, it's, I like it. Um, just sipping on wine the whole day and eating charcuterie and just, the, it's so beautiful and it's, yeah. But I love my country as well. What about you, Steve? Where would you, where would you like to go other than Yara? Oh, look, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I also, you know, love, you know, Northern Italy. Um, you know, I love the sort of the culture of Italian wine. I love the the attitudes that, uh, you know, what you don't finish today, you can finish tomorrow. Um, you know, we need to sort of, you know, get home by 8 o'clock because we've got some love to make um, or something like that, you know, amongst the, the Italian winemakers. I don't think they take things too seriously, which is great. Uh, but, you know, I, I too, I really sort of enjoy the, um, you know, and, and I think Italian varieties are, you know, incredibly interesting and, uh, you know, they're, they're quite unique. They have a sort of a savoury element to them. And, uh, and I think the food and the wine is so good in, in Italy as well. And, you know, it's nice sort of going and, you know, visiting those regions and spending a bit of time with some of the winemakers. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, just a little bit on fermentation and reds before we move on to the wines. You talk about um, things when you use stems, when you use whole bunches, um, just just different ways you choose to make wine and what you what you get from those parts of the winemaking process. If that's not too broad in general. Um, do do you want me to answer that first, or yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so stems. Um, you know, I think stems are probably one of the one of the things that we really you know knew so little about when I certainly graduated from. Um, from uni um you know and i think uh, even working for big companies there wasn't a lot of um whole bunch use or you know the use of stems in winemaking but even now we're learning more and more about um you know the use of whole bunch you know fermentation and and um and yeah not not necessarily carbonic maceration but just uh but just you know including whole you know putting a having a bin of whole bunches and basically you know putting a bit of fermenting wine in the bottom of it and treading a small portion of it each day until you sort of get around it and things like that over a sort of four to five day period but um you know i think there's a lot of you know real merit in you know that sort of thing and i think um it uh, can give some very interesting characters um you know, I think one of the most interesting aspects of whole bunch fermentation that we find is that we get less whole bunch character when we do 100% whole bunch than we do when we do partially whole bunch fermentation. So, um, you know, and it's it's probably got something to do with the, the juice to whole bunch ratio in a 100% whole bunch is so much lower. There's very little juice really in the thing to be absorbing all of this you know, these sort of stemmy characters. Whereas when we 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 put maybe 20 or 25% whole bunches in a in a de-stemmed 
ferment uh, you know into some crushed grapes or partially crushed grapes you you do absorb a lot of that stemmy character sort of in the rest of the wine in 75 percent of the rest of the wine so um we're we're tending more to to do 100 percent whole bunch fermentation in 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 a sort of in a vessel and then we're doing a hundred percent you know de-stemmed or um you know hopefully perfectly de-stemmed fruit and doing some intracellular fermentation so you know just so you know fermentation in the berry itself so we're looking for the um you know for those sort of you know classical on um type um whole berry ferments and uh, on on one hand, and then we're looking at 100% whole bunch in the other, and then perhaps having a look at blending the two, you know, later on. Okay. Fab, what about you, Zoe? Uh, I must agree that it's so interesting that when you think you do like 100%, you're going to get it's going to be different, and it's it's so true that I've done a lot of trials with adding even adding. 20% of whole bunches at the bottom of the tank or 20% in the middle or 20% on top. You get three different wine styles of it's the same grapes, just adding the whole bunches in a different portion of the tank. It actually makes a difference. Same with Petit Vidot. I don't do whole bunches with Petit. I do whole berries. So when you put the whole berries at the bottom, middle or at the top, it's totally different wines. And it's amazing how a small thing like that can actually make Make or break a wine. Um, so when I when the grapes arrive in in my small little winery, uh, we put it in a container. So uh, refer cold to make it cold overnight. So I always say the grapes get the opportunity to sleep at KWV to adapt for their first night out. So they sleep at KWV for the first night. Then the next day we will do bun sorting and berry sorting, and then I do cold soak so i do add enzymes and tartaric acid on the grapes as soon as it arrived in the winery so steve i uh, when i started at kwv um our chief winemaker was richard rowe i don't know if you know him he's australian so he used to work uh, he was my mentor so I, he was the first chief winemaker i worked with at kwv um and he always said to me always go back to the basics you can play around with a lot of things, but go back to the basics and understanding the vineyard. So I will use only whole bunches or stems. Sometimes I will even crush the whole bunches just to get the stems into, into the tank. So I will only use it when it's at optimum ripeness. I will look at the stems and then I'll decide in which blocks I can actually add, add the stems. And um, so it gives you a different texture it gives you a different tannin structure, but I won't put that wine as 100% in a bottle. That would o- always be a component. And the one thing I've trialed with this year especially is because Pinot is truly South African varietal and in the textbook of producing Pinot Tars, they say you never use whole bunches or natural ferment on Pinot Tars because it creates a lot of volatility. Um, and I've done 66% whole bunches, 100% natural ferment, this year on one of the Pinot Tars blocks, and it's got the lowest pH, uh, uh, the lowest VA in the whole winery. It's got an after fermentation 0.14 VA. It's the lowest in the winery. So sometimes I just feel like we need to throw the textbook away um, and just push the boundaries a bit, but then get back to the basics. You can make a lot of different components, but going back to the basic and tasting, I taste every morning at 5 a.m. I will walk through the winery, taste every single wine. Every tank is treated differently. There's no recipes. Everything's done on tasting. Then in the afternoon, I'll taste 12 o'clock, I'll taste again. And just before the night shift arrive in the winery, I'll taste again. And making decisions on what do I need to do? Because if I have whole bunches or natural ferment in the winery, it's going to be 100% different than the wines that's been 100% crushed with different yeasts. Um, And I don't, I do add yeast to all of the, not all of the wines, but about 80% of our wines. Um, But the wines that I know, like Shiraz, I do a lot of natural ferment on, um, and I do the fermentation a bit lower, not high. And it's interesting how the wines just shows more florals, Um, but then also pressing and tasting and 
doing the cap management is all made decisions made on tasting of the wine. So I try not to follow recipes, but just the basic picking date, managing your pH, and selecting the right barrels. That for me is the three basic things that you can't compromise on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, let's let's move on to the wines. Um, yes. Uh, Steve, you got the you got the wines there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, well as well, why don't you, why don't you tell why don't you tell us about the wines that Steve's drinking and why you why you chose them? Yeah. <laughs> so the first wine, Steve, you've got the Shannon. Yes, I have. Okay. So the Sweden Blanc. So, so the whole philosophy about the metal cellar was um, we created the cellar to lift the whole quality of KWV brand because uh, a lot of people have the wrong perception of a bigger winery. So they thought that you, we just only made like entry level everyday drinking wines. So we created this small little boutique cellar in between the biggest cellars at KWV where we can do different pickings, different regions. We can play around with, I put one block into five different tanks. I do five different experiments. So the cellar is really, it's small and the tanks are my size. So I'm, I'm very short. So I can actually stand on my toes and look into the tanks. Um, so we have the opportunity with this brand to, this is now Chenin Blanc from Schwartland, or you get a Chenin Blanc from Paul or from coastal region. So we get this different blocks. And what meets our quality expectation at the end of the year before bottling, we will put into the bottle. So the blend might be different every year. The style might be slightly different every year. But this specific block is um, about 32 years old. So it's old bush vines. The berries are so small. I once posted a photo of a berry in my hand on Facebook. And one of my friends phoned me. He said to me, I know harvest time, you're not sleeping a lot, but are you really going crazy now? Because you're posting photos of your hand on Facebook. I said, no, but look closely. There's a small little berry on my hand. Um, and this is this vignette specific block. It's like when you bite into it, you get that apricots and almost limes and um, peaches in the um, grape. But then it carries through to the wine. So I will divide this block into four different tanks. And when it starts with fermentation, we will take it to barrels and do fermentation in barrels, play a bit with um, the one portion will be natural ferment, the other one will be inoculated, and the third um, portion, we won't rehydrate the yeast. We will actually take the dry yeast and add it into the barrel. So it starts naturally, and then the dry yeast will just finish fermentation. So this is nine months in oak. About 30% is new barrels, but only 500 uh, litre barrels. Um, so, yeah, hope you enjoy the wine. Great. Do you, what do you reckon, Steve? Yeah, look, lovely, you know, lovely textural wine. I, I you know, very, you know, very drinkable. Um, nice bit of saltiness, which I think is is awesome. Um, you know, just I, I wouldn't have actually picked it as Chenin Blanc. I, I think our... Our understanding of Chenin Blanc in Australia is pretty limited. Um, you know, about the only Chenin Blanc I ever try is from uh, from the Loire Valley. Generally, you know, I don't get to try you know much South African wine. But um, yeah, look, it's uh, you know, I, I can't see any oak character, which I think is great. You know, great wine making. Um, I love it when you know there's there's nuance of of uh, of uh, of cask, but but nothing sort of stands out. But yeah, very really. Really lovely, um, bright, um, salty, textural white wine. And I think it's still a bit young. Uh, it can take another year or two in the bottle and just age. And the thing with the white wines, I try to tend to make it approachable now, but also make it so that you can keep it for five to eight years. And I think that's a big gem for us in South Africa that we have the ability with white wines to get ageability on it. But yep. I don't know if it's in Australia like that as well, but the people want to drink the 2023 vintage already and we haven't even started harvesting. So it's a really, it's a mind shift that we need to make and get the people to understand all the white wines. For me, I, I, I love all the white wines. Yeah. Yeah, we, we find in Australia that, um, you know, that it, it's the same sort of thing people want. You know, people think that a two-year-old white wine on the shelf has has had it, but um, but I certainly think that 
you know, a lot of a lot of great varieties, you know, particularly things like, you know, Chardonnay and Pinot Gris need sort of uh, need 18 months to, to you know, to five years to, to really open up and show some of the, you know, some of the non-fermentation characters. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can I talk about the Petit Verdot? Have you got the, is it the straight Petit Verdot you've got, Steve, or the orchestra okay. blend? Oh, the orchestra. Um, I don't know. It's a wine called, uh, it's called The Mentors. Yeah, and the orchestra. name of the orchestra. Okay, so the orchestra. Um, so the orchestra is a border style blend. And it's, don't just have the five border varietals in it. It's got six border varietals in it. So it's uh, Cabernet dominated, then Petit Verdot, Merlot, Malbec, um, Cabernet Franc, and then it's got Carmenet. And Carmenere, there's only 8.5 hectares planted in the whole of South Africa. And we've got a block that's 1.86 hectares. Uh, and we actually launched 100% Carmenere as well. So in 2017, and we actually did it in the UK at Shakespeare's Globe. And it was a fantastic event. And we had all the journalists there and we had a really good event. Um, and so for me, August the name says all... Well, it's like all the different instruments doesn't always make the best sound on its own. All the different border varietals doesn't always make the best wine on its own. But blending them together, it actually makes a perfect wine and it brings out different characters that you actually want in a wine. So most of the grapes is sourced from Stalamos region. Um, there's one, only the Malbec portion is from Paul region. Um, so, and a Petit Verdot, a bit from other side of the mountain. So that's why it's Western Cape on the label. But for me, this wine is it's the biggest volume of the Mentors range. We produce about 30,000 liters of this wine. Um, and it's the wine that we can actually scale in this range. So 18 months in barrel, 70% is new French oak. And the uh, other 30 is second and third full barrels, but mostly second full barrels. Um, but getting the art of blending for me is probably one of the most important things, not, not just with different varietals, but also with different regions in South Africa. Getting to understand the different vineyards, the different varietals, the different characteristics, and the flavors that you get out of a specific block um, makes it's more challenging to get that right and to understand that than just the basic winemaking things. So I love blending. I love tasting. It takes me about two months to blend this wine because I taste every single barrel allocated to the specific um, brand. Um, so, yeah. It's, and if the quality is not good enough, I won't put it in the bottle. If it's one of the brands where it's not sales driven. So what I have that meets our quality expectation, we will put into the bottle. If it's a thousand liters or if it's 50,000 liters, then the company is very happy, um, but then we'll put it in the bottle. But everything's about just quality, quality, quality. Um, so, so uh, bit of old world palate, but new world fruit. Yeah, is this, is this, a, is this a Cabernet that can, that can crack the youth market, Steve? <laughs> Um, yeah, look, it's it's um, I I think it's sort of for me it's a combination of that sort of leafy character and some really sort of lovely sort of earthen notes about it. I think there's some of those sort of characteristics. Um, it's probably a little bit more traditional than than where I'm trying to to go, but um, but it's you know it's different markets for different people. So um, I'm probably looking for maybe a, a little bit um, a little bit more soft softness rather than the classic tannins that you get with with the with the Bordeaux varieties um but I do like you know there are aspects of this that I really love I think the I, I love the the you know it's uh, got some of those sort of rustic notes about it I think that's sort of really lovely I think the um I think combined with some leafiness it's you know it's classic Bordeaux type type wine um uh, I don't know what the alcohol is, but I imagine it's, you know, is it 13 and a half or 14? 14. Sorry? 14 and a half. 14 and a half, yeah. So it's certainly, you know, I mean, um, for, for a wine with that amount of alcohol, it's actually still got quite nice leafiness and, 
and sort of freshness about it. But yeah, very, very, very drinkable and you know, lovely, lovely sort of wine. But you know, I'm probably steering the ship in a slightly different direction, which is what winemakers do, you know. So and which wines did you choose to send to send to Azel? I mean it was a Pinot and a Cabernet? Well, We've got yeah, we we put in one of the newer cabernets, and I think there's a Pinot Noir there as well. Pinot. So, yeah. um, but uh, maybe we could talk about the Pinot Noir first. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Is that what you'd like me to do? Or yeah, 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 please, that'd be great. Yeah, so if you if you've got the Pinot there, um, can you tell me what vintage you've got? Twenty twenty one. Okay, can I see the bottle? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so this is a, um, a light, uh, you know, fresh style um, Pinot Noir that we make, 2021, um, you know, where it was, was probably one of the best vintages for, for you know, Pinot Noir that we've um, we produced. You know, this one's uh, one of our less expensive um, Pinot Noirs. It, um, it's more fruit driven, not a lot of sort of oak character to it, but it's just a, a really nice sort of, um, uh, you know, Pinot Noir with freshness, really nice varietal sort of characteristics. It's got sort of softness and elegance. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, we, we think it's a lovely wine. Yeah, I agree. It's a, a lot of uh, cherries, red cherries, and uh, hints of plums, but also I love the, Canon structure on it. It's a fine, elegant, well integrated, well balanced. It ticks all the boxes. Um, but I love the freshness, the cherries, it jumps out of the glass and it immediately tells you, I'm Pinot Noir and I'm here. I've got a bit of that floral notes as well. Um, so, yeah, lovely wine. I, I, I agree with everything you said on lighter style, but it's, it's one of those wines that you can actually enjoy with brunch with lunch and with dinner. Yeah. So this is a, it, it's a very large blend that we do. It, um, so, you know, this would be uh, uh, 250,000 litres or thereabouts of, uh, of, of Pinot Noir. So it's a, it's a big blend and it comes from several different, um, you know, several, you know, different vineyards. We've got a lot of Pinot um, sort of vineyards. We've, we've, we've got a couple of, uh, um, forty hectare estates of of Pinot that we we pick and and uh, 20, 2021 was a really fantastic year you know for us twenty twenty two is is a good quality year but the volume is about uh, half of what it was last year so it's interesting it's, it's interesting you mentioning that it um, on all our quality blocks that we receive the volume is also about fifty percent down. Um, on the other blocks, for the more everyday drinking wines, the volumes is up. Uh, the times are up, but on the premium wines, all the volumes is down this year. We didn't expect that. Very good wine. And then you've for got that, the for that volume. It's exceptional. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it does it does very well for us over here. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the one of the newest additions to the range, I think, is it the Melba Melba Amphora Cabernet? Yeah, Cabernet, twenty nineteen. So I think this is the first vintage of this wine, Steve. Yeah, so yeah, this is a wine that we, um, we 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 really wanted to try and do something different with Cabernet, and as I explained earlier, we we're really trying some different uh, some different fermentation sort of you know vessels and uh, you know things like that, and uh, we. We really love the idea of you know fermenting Cabernet in in either uh, clay or in concrete. Um, we we think that um, if, if we can produce wines without um, the influence of oak character, it might you know it might be sort of quite different. And one of the nice things about these quite porous vessels, like a like an amphora or a or an oak vessel, in in to to a certain extent, um, is that. Uh, you get a lot of the polymerization of the tannins or the, a lot of the softening of the tannins happening while the wines are on skins. So you know, this wine um, sat on skins for 150 days and, um, and then we put it in cask in, in some, some 500 litre cask for, um, for another 150 days. And um, so it's not a long time in, in oak. In fact, we've changed the, 
we've changed our philosophy slightly in the in the three years that we've been making this. And um, in 2021, we we um, we basically um, sort of fermented on skins in amphora. For those that don't know what an amphora is, it's a large uh, earthen pot. They hold a thousand liters, um, and we 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 put the the destemmed fruit inside these things and we do four or five of them for this particular wine and um and we, we, we we've got a little plastic you know plunger that we can plunge or we can dip our feet into the top of it and try and break up the skins etc uh some pichage with the um, with some clean feet hopefully and uh and then uh, but a, a lot of that sort of softening of the tannin occurs in the uh, you know on skins and so when we when we go to release the wine, you know, the wines are already, um, you know, not fully mature, but they are already done a lot of their ageing and softening and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, for, for a lot of people, a lot of the journalists over here um, and a lot of consumers that, you know, are buying this sort of wine are really loving the fact that it's, it's, it's soft, it's elegant, it's not traditional Cabernet. It's very different. It's uh, maybe a little lighter. It has some... Some Pinot influence, you know, some Pinot winemaker influence type thing, you know. So um, it's it's a little different. So yeah, I'd be interested in people's reactions. Yeah, uh, immediately when you pick up the glass, you get again. I get sour cherries, like almost savoury notes, um, but a lot of red fruit. And when you taste it, it actually, if when I think back to my days at school, we had this blackboard with the erasers, with the chalkiness. You almost get that fine, almost almost roan tannins, very fine, integrated, soft, elegant, um, very interesting wine. I would definitely drink a lot of this. Um, it's, it's totally different than your normal standard Cabernet. But with the tannin structures still, you know, it's a very serious wine and it's, yeah, I like it. And, and look, one, one of the things that, um, you know, that uh, we, we often ask people about wines like this is, you know, could you pick the variety? And, um, you know, not many people would pick Cabernet for, for, for this. And um, I, I like wines that are variety incidental, you know, who really cares what variety it is if it's delicious, you know. And um, there's a, a wine that is, um, it's called uh, Grange de Pup and it's from the, from the, from the, uh, from the Languedoc Roussillon region. It's uh, near, near, it's a vineyard near Montpellier. And um, it's, it's Cabernet, you know, it has a fair bit of Cabernet in it. And yet, it, it's a wine that I would probably think has got more Rhone or more Southern French character than the, you know, varieties that go in it. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, we're really trying hard to make some Cabernet this year, as I explained earlier, that, that maybe is a little bit variety incidental, um, trying some different sorts of things to, um, to maybe not, not so much take the variety and the, but, but maybe uh, you know give some different characters with Cabernet. So, so this is just one little thing that we've been doing lately, and uh, we're we're very pleased with the results. Excellent. And that's I mean that's sort of the historically European way, isn't it? It's you know a, it's a wine of a place. It's not the it's not the it's not the varietals. It's yeah. you know yeah. it, it's 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 Bordeaux, it's Saint Emilion, it's it's Chateauneuf de Pape, whatever it is. It's it's the it, it's the place that matters, not the not the not the makeup sure. behind it. And, and your your comment earlier was was, was interesting. You know that that uh, you know people want to call you know um, wine by the variety all the time. And um, yeah. you know in in Australia, if you blend two varieties, it's deemed as inferior by ninety percent of the population. Um, uh, you know people think that a single variety is higher in quality than a you know than a blend. I don't know if it's the same in in yeah, South exactly. Africa, but. Yeah. Um, but you know, people seem to want the assurance of the variety with new world wines, uh, but they seem to be um, fairly happy with the ambiguity of of old world wine. That's always the way. The, yeah, the old world gets a pass that the new world is not uh, is not granted. Yeah, sadly. Sure. <laughs> it's interesting how they want 
interesting varietals. They want the varietal, but on in South Africa, what we see is blends. Usually, uh, on the white side, they think it's entry level, but on the red side, people think it's a very expensive again. Um, so they will pay a lot more for for a red blend than even for a single varietal. So, except if it's like a niche varietal, like a Petit Verdot or a Carmenere or Nebbiolo or Sangiovese, uh, they will pay a lot more. But yeah, it's yeah, a marketing. It's a marketing red, yeah. behind it. That's that more red, important. That, that red blend thing's feeding in from from California and yeah. from to, from the southern from Southern America to Point as well. But it's like it's like oh, I really like red blend. Like okay, but a red blend of what? Like, I, I don't know. It's like it, you know, it's so again, again, it's 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 simplifying something that's not that simple. But that that's yeah. kind of what the, that's what you need to do from a consumer perspective. Sometimes, I guess. Um, <laughs> okay, guys, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got for your for your time. I've just got a one uh, a, a quick fire round to go through. Um, just a, an, an either or questions. So I'll just ask you, and if is Isel, you go first, Steve, you go second, uh, and then and then we're done. So uh, Bordeaux or Burgundy? Uh, Bordeaux. Steve. Burgundy. <laughs> uh, wild yeast or commercial yeast? Uh, commercial. Wild. Uh, French oak or American oak? French. Yeah, yeah, we we all love French oak. <laughs> Sherry or port? Port. Um, yeah, I love them both. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, whole bunches or de-stemming? Uh, de-stem. Yeah, I, I want a bit of. I want a bit of both. I'm afraid. <laughs> aperitif or digestive? Uh, aperitif. Uh, aperitif for me too. Yeah. Uh, single varietal or blend? Uh, blend. Yeah, it depends on the it depends on the variety. I don't like anything blended with Pinot or Chardonnay, but I love <laughs> um, I love blends of uh, of other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, barnyard or forest floor? Forest floor. Yeah, same. <laughs> uh, aged red or aged white? Uh, aged red. Um, aged white I'll go uh, dinner party or Sunday lunch uh, dinner party Definitely. Sunday lunch every time <laughs> <laughs> uh, long Sunday lunch absolutely uh, Blanc de Blanc or Blanc de Noir Blanc de Blanc yeah same uh, steel or amphora uh still. Ah, uh, well, I, I'm I'm biased. You've got yeah, you got to say I'm for it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, old world or new world? Uh, new world. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah. new world. Yeah. Uh, Pilifume or Pilifuise? Sorry. Uh, Pilifume or Pilifuise? Uh, first yeah. one. Pilifume per- for me. Yeah. Uh, buttery or minerality? Uh, minerality. Same. And gin or whiskey? Whiskey! <laughs> yeah, too, too difficult for me. I love them both. <laughs> uh, okay. More wine. <laughs> oh, and obviously more wine. Um, that's us. Guys, okay. thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if there's okay. nothing else you want to um, add then thank you very much and we'll share yeah. the the videos with you once they've been uh, once they've been edited and done okay thank you thank you nice meeting you steve yep bye